Greetings, everybody. If you're wondering who the hell I am, my name is Brett DeHoot, and I'm about to share with you to facilitate for you a community innovation showcase. Can I please, though they have done nothing to justify it so far, ask you to welcome our four panellists as they make their way to the stage. Come forth, panellists. <laughs> welcome to uh, Communities in Control 2019, the first Communities in Control conference of the Morrisonian era. And I've been a part of this conference, except it, folks, the election's been run. Um, how was your weekend, lefties? Anyway, I, I have been a part of this conference since day one. It's a great honour and a pleasure and a privilege, and I usually take this opportunity to wax lyrical about how much a Communities in Control means to me, means to conference goers, and means to the community. But I thought this year, given the results of the weekend's election, I would wax Morrisonian and simply say, how good's this conference? <laughs> and furthermore, go Sharks. <laughs> I have no idea what any of that means. I'm just pleased to be out of the Canberra bubble. Am I right? Am I right? Yeah. <laughs> that word innovation, good Lord. I lived most of my childhood without hearing it whatsoever. My 20s and my 30s. Now it's thrown around like so much confetti. And what does it mean to us in the community sector? And by us, I mean you. I'm a yuppie consultant. But what does innovation mean? Is it all open plan offices and Slack chats? For me, it's adopting high technology. Fun fact, I'm appearing before you via hologram. Yes, I'm a contemporary person. But does it mean breaking down those silos, which used just to store wheat, but now they mean so much more? It, can we identify underserved audiences? Can we measure and evaluate? I don't know, but these people do because they are all innovators in their own way, shape or form. And that's why we're going to hear from them. You will hear from them each. We're going to meet Elise. We're going to meet Anita. We're going to meet Madeline. But first of all, Dennis Ginevan, who had a terrific weekend because he is part of Voices for Indi. He is part of the resistance that believes in a participatory <laughs> democracy. Yes, of course, he will be crushed, but before that inevitably <laughs> happens, we've got him on stage. He is a man who has devoted his working life and beyond the working life to particularly rural and regional communities. Are there any rural and or regional folk in the room? Make some noise. Yay. Welcome to our metropolis. <laughs> He was part at the very start of Voices for Indi in 2012. He's worked in uh, agricultural economics, facilitation, mediation, social work, rural financial counselling as well. It's a big thing. And um, also wants to have the beautiful town of Yakandanda to be powered exclusively by renewable energy. Is this right? That is right. Oh, you're living a dream. All right. <laughs> He also wants you to know that Voices for Indi is more than just deciding who the hell represents that part of the world. Now it is, of course, Helen Haynes, and as you probably already know, that is the first time, this is still correct, the first time in Australian political history where one independent member of parliament has handed over to another independent member of parliament. And if there's one thing they've got, folks, it's merch. Have a look at that merch in the back corner there. Dennis, I'll ask you to take to the lectern over there and share with us some of your wisdom and your innovations. Please make him very welcome. Dennis Ginnivan. Thanks very much, Brett. I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> we won. <laughs> It's a real, it's a, I wanted to thank Communities in Control and they're, they're from our community, Dennis and Maureen in particular, the ones that I've been working with, and they, um, it's, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. We've, we've previously, I've previously uh, represented Voices for Indi in, in making a presentation here, but I wanted to also acknowledge, as you, Brett, Brett did, to some extent for the rural people, but there are a number of people in this room who are also have been involved in the, that committee and also the recent campaign that was been successful, and they're over this way over here. So thanks guys, good to have you here. Um, I wanted to start off with a little bit of a, a, a summary of what Voices for Indi is and then what the campaign is. And they are separate entities, but they've got, they're related as well. Um, and I'll, I'm happy to take questions later on because I think that that's going to be the best part of it. 
So Voices for Indi started in 2012 and it kicked on from, kicks off, relates to that theme that we've been speaking about today about getting, uh, getting angry but then getting organised. And I think back then in 2012, um, w there was a, a number of people, a lot of people were starting to feel quite strongly about the way they were being represented by the federal member at the time. Um, and in a way, whilst it's easy to get angry at someone for them not doing what it is you think they should be doing, the other side of that same coin is, well, for me, I, re I realise, well, I've been asleep at my own democratic wheel, in a sense. I have not but done what I should, be, have, should have been doing to step up. And I think a, num a number of other people, that was for them the similar issue. So Voices for Indi formed in 2012, uh, gathered around how, we, how can we improve community participation, um, democracy, civic engagement, how can we make that a, a good idea from the ground up, from the grassroots up rather than the, the, the party down. And um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll abbreviate it all, but it, one of the key things that we decided to do was to run kitchen table conversations, which was really, doesn't have to be in a kitchen. It could be in a pub, but you'd have to be early in the night to do it in a pub. Um, or, or anywhere where you could get 10 to 12 people together to start talking about what it is that, it, what your representation, your community, what you want to do about your community into the future uh, could be. So we, we documented and captured all the comments from about 600 people, 550 people, excuse me. Um, and put that into a report and coming up to the 2013 election um, we gave a copy of that report to each candidate um, and uh, we discovered that um, it wasn't the case that the existing federal member saw that as very important because she claimed that she already knew what everyone thought in, um, in Indi. <clears throat> so in effect we decided to stand a, a support of an independent candidate to um, stand for the federal election in 2013, and Cathy McGowan, who many of you, I'm sure you'll be aware of, is a federal independent member for the last six years. Cathy was elected and, um, and has made um, a, quite a substantial contribution in, in representing our community, but also into the national public debate. So we've done other things like bringing speakers to the region to encourage people to get involved in democratic processes, Last year we ran a workshop called Getting Elected to Represent Your Community, which we thought was a pretty good byline really, uh, as opposed to getting elected to represent your, your own best career wishes. You know? And so we really we wanted to have a sense of accountability and a kind of res a responsibility for anyone standing to, for them to see what, what it is the job is, that they're a servant of the people. Um, and that's not to sort of say the community wants to dominate, but rather to, to step up to make sure you have a, a healthy into you know, into reach into uh, agreement between community and representative, so that what they take to Canberra is essentially what it is that the community uh, is saying to that person, to your representative. So um, that workshop, uh, we had about uh, 80 people attend, I think, and um, quite a few people who are aspiring to become a politician, um, or someone is supporting somebody else to be a politician, to stand for politics. Um, we had a uh, a wide range of uh, speakers around a whole, whole lot of topics like ethics, uh, marketing, campaigning, I won't go in any order, but there's a whole gamut of a, a wide range of elements that are involved in, in standing for, for, um, for parliament, one of which was the partner of um, a, a politician. So what, it is, what does it mean to a spouse, to a partner, to have you know, that life you know, in your world? Um, and after six years, Cathy um, gave annou uh, announced that she was retiring. Um, la late last year was well, we, we felt that would could happen, but what Voices for Indi did was ran a, a process to find um, a replacement, someone, to, a candidate who would um, take over and, and carry the same idea of community representative politics uh, into the next election. Um, and the long and short was that Helen, Helen Haynes. Uh, was was selected and has just we've just run the campaign and on Saturday night I'm still feeling the effects. We had a celebration party called Indi Counts and it does count. Um, and now and now I'm trying to recover from the party because it was a, it was a great night. Um, so the idea, I guess the the threads that I wanted to draw out of all this, I hope you're picking them up, but we can maybe do more in questions. Is what 
innovation or, and community, how those two words can, can intersect. And we've done that through the democratic political representation and engagement side of it. But then we ran a campaign. Um, and that's where it's also recent. It's, it's just it's been, it's been going on for since um, February and finished on the weekend. So we had 1,750 signed up volunteers for, that, for this campaign, all of whom by not only signing up with their name, address and um, or their <coughs> postcode, excuse me, they get into a, da a database, but we also said, um, well, sign once you've read the value statement that uh, you're signing up for. So it meant that uh, everyone knew, who had signed up knew and anyone who was walking around with an orange T-shirt had already uh, um, committed to a set of values as to how we're going to run this campaign and what it is to hold true to that. So you had confidence in strangers because you knew that they'd actually done the same thing and you also had a potential for accountability, you know, like a KPI performance review, as was mentioned earlier this morning, but we didn't have to do anything. We didn't have to do anything about um, pulling anybody into line through this campaign. It was a really well behaved and focused and positive and optimistic campaign despite the challenges and despite the fact that Helen was a new candidate, not, not known as well as Cathy had been. So, um, and as, as uh, we said earlier, it's the first time that there's been an independent back-to-back -back, um, election, uh, independent candidate. So we did a lot of things that shaped our campaign, and these are some of the threads too, where innovation and community come together that um, I think we can talk about further. But one of the things is that there was about um, 800 of these little guys uh, cut out of pre-used uh, core flutes. So this is repurposed and then repainted. And we just turned it into a, a, cock a cockatoo um, with a campaign colour. And it was it evokes the idea of a whole lot of people getting together, what I call squawking and talking, <laughs> and in a, in a, um, a collective, in a rural setting. Um, so. And if you didn't want to have a sign on your, on your house, or if you didn't want to have a difficult conversation to say who, you, who broadly are you supporting, then you could just hang one of these on your mailbox, on your fence, uh, in a tree, near, wherever, it, wherever it was. So that's, this became evocative of a whole lot more than a piece of core flute with an orange paint on it. It sort of became uh, like a, a badge of uh, who you are in this campaign. So they're all over the place. I don't know how we're going to clear the landscape of, up of them, but um, it was such a, it was a lot of fun to, to muck around with this sort of stuff, as well as um, orange-coloured um, socks, jewellery, scarves. I can see a little bit of orange in the room over here. Um, but but it, likewise, it was a, a good-spirited campaign, but orange and colour was a, a big part of it. We had humorous-looking vehicles running around that sort of, in a way, um, disarmed the intensity of politics because it, it meant that people didn't have to be all, you know, oh, it's a bloody left and it's a bloody right and they hate each other's guts. He hate each other's guts. It was actually more like a, a goodwill, a celebration of democracy, and we, we tried to have that theme. When they go low in our, in, in our campaign, when our, our competitors did that, we went high. And so it's, it's, it's a Michelle Obama phrase. I'm finishing up now, Brett. Um, but what it, what it did was evoke the idea that we were going to be above the usual style of politics and we we're going to be our best behaviour, make democracy fun, get involved, enjoy it. Thank you very much. I think I speak on behalf of all of us when I say, how good's Dennis? Okay, now, shame he didn't have time to talk about Voices for Indies Phase 2. Uh, purpose, which is taking control of the local water supply. Uh, no orange cockatoo on your letterbox, no showers for you. Now, Elise, I'm going to change what I told you before and ask you to present from this lectern so you can control your exquisite presentation from this laptop computer. Now, Elise McGrath joins us from Kutamundra. Who knows where Kutamundra is? New South Wales and the Riverine. Who knows a fun fact? about Kutamandra, an oft-quoted fun fact about Kutamandra. It is the birthplace of, sir? Yeah. 
Donald Bradman. It is also renowned for its wattle festival and recently its passionate embrace of the arts, thanks to Elise McGrath, who is the cultural development officer of the Arts Centre in Kudamundra. It was just nice Kudamandra. to be introduced. We're about to watch that video, which will... <laughs> which Alan decided to start before I had finished, <laughs> um, which will highlight one very exciting project which brings together people with disabilities, without disabilities, under the guise of arts, but for something far greater. Because Elise is a believer not just in the arts, but in the value of relationships. Please make Elise McGrath very welcome. We already know the video is working. <laughs> it was just nice to be introduced to other people who are different, but they, they want to have fun, they want to be creative. If I felt cared around these people, I felt like I could trust them, and they were very, they were very kind, they were loving, they understood, they listened. Um, they had a funny feeling inside my body. They're all funny and goofy like the rest of us and they just relate to us. It feels like a very safe, non-judgmental place where sometimes you don't get that in the world. The Bowerbird theme, it's really about bringing things together that might not typically be together. So this morning we started with a series of activities that are really designed to break the ice. By doing it through kind of fun activities, theatre-based activities, it's providing this opportunity in a non-invasive way. And so these, these different strategies help people trust, relax, connect, and it takes the attention off themselves. The theme for this being uh, to nest, the idea of building a safe place, building a home. Uh, I found it very enjoyable. It's been really good fun and I've learned a lot about the process and how to warm up and all these different things and it's just really compounded on my own um, interest and my own knowledge. I like uh, creating new things and trying new things. So in the morning we're really exploring theatre and movement storytelling and a little bit of drawing, you know, what that might be expressed through drawing. And then in the afternoon, we were taking that into more of a visual arts setting where we headed into the visual arts studio and working with um, Beverly Moxon, a local fibre artist. I'm sort of making like a spider web or a dream catcher. I find it quite relaxing, but at times it can be a bit frustrating. The younger ones could make the circle and then they could make it as complex as they wanted. They could add things to it or just make it basic. And this was just sort of relaxing and calming and you could just make it up as you go. There was no right, there was no wrong and we'll be able to walk through them, interact with them. The lights probably will pick up the sparkle on the beads and they'll be so proud to think that they did it themselves and they all came together and made this one wonderful installation. I think they all felt safe. I think they all felt respected and appreciated for their contribution. There's lots of love in the nest because that's where the love lives. I would take away basically a memory to be excited to come back here next year. In my role with the museum, I've recently been working with people with a diverse range of disabilities. Today's given me a lot of encouragement and direction and guidance and good contacts for the future. It dispelled a lot of myths for me. A bit of education around the language of disability, um, just best practices, what to say. So I guess equip myself with the right language to start with. Well, it's equipping me for the classroom and, and even just thinking about what we've got for our school and what we can improve on. And potentially some ideas of how to engage audiences and artists with disabilities in what we do. When you work in the arts, it's really good to always just take some time out and stop and reflect on your own practice and allow a different point of view to resonate within you for a day. There's no way I was sitting down for that kind of stuff. It was really easy and it was fun. Really refreshing and um, reinvigorating.
the durational art with the twine and wool, it was almost an instinct that you would have this vision in your head, but when it came to the moment, it just happens. And no matter where you put it, even if there's another thread on both ends, no two are the same because there's always a difference in tension or even just the emotion put into them. Collaboration is a creative enabling tool, particularly working inclusively, where each person can have their place. The more time we have with the participants, the closer we become, the more we understand them on an intuitive level. In the house, each room represents something meaningful. Each different artwork then brought that room to life. It was really peaceful and bliss, honestly. It makes you funny. It makes you laugh. Comfortable, because I was with people that I trust and know well. It felt aesthetic, because the sound and the lights were beautiful. Grateful, in a way that lets us express our feelings with art. Everything was so multifaceted that you could just lose yourself in all the artwork. I felt quite full, like full of energy. I felt kind of empowered seeing everything that we've created together come together and be able to react to that together. We've all done the activities one by one each series in one year, which is really amazing. I felt proud and happy of what we've all made and discovered together. In this context, it's not a final production. What it is, is a sharing of process. And what that really means is a sharing of each person's contribution to the process. Some participants have experienced art for the very first time, but not just once. They've experienced it over eight different workshops. And so it's that personal investment that then develops over a period of time into pride. Being a part of this in the creative process as well as the performing process has really like inspired me and instilled a confidence in me. But now I feel like I can take anything on. It's also been really lovely just to see that whether it's with or without a disability, whether it's young or old, whatever it is, it's actually not mattered. What's mattered is the work that we're making. And like making the connections throughout the time and you've made memories together brings a new form of trust and especially for the kids that haven't been on stage before they're a little bit nervous they're not sure what to expect but when they have people around them that they've worked with and made friends with and made memories with and everything they feel like safe. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's really hard to be a gig after all those beautiful young people. Um, it's a great pleasure to join you today from Kudamundra and to probably talk about the creative arts and how empowering it can be. But the call to action for the panellists is, what are the transferable lessons? So I know so many of you work at the grassroots uh, and work in community and not always on art projects. I think one of the key things I think about as a cultural development officer is the power of a long-term vision. I think uh, for each and every one of us, uh, our community may not see that vision yet, but before we can take the steps to reach that vision, you have to hold it in your mind's eye. Um, a little bit of context information about Kudamundra to, to give you a sense of why that project was so valuable. We are a community, community of five and a half thousand people in a rural town. and. Um, 
the participants that you saw on the video, I would say approximately 50% uh, live with disability, identify with disability, and 50% come from uh, fairly mainstream settings. We are still a town that has segregated settings, so there still is a day program and a special school. And one of the things that really matters about working inclusively is uh, there's a phrase in inclusive education, you know, we need to learn together to learn to live together. And I think um, if I can say anything about this project that's transferable is it's about relationships and about relationships in community. Um, there's a very uh, inspiring arts worker from Victoria called Jade Lilly, and she has a project called The Relationship is the Project, and I think she's spot on. Um, good relationships, and earlier today we've had a number of speakers who've spoken to us about that. Good relationships are fundamental to our sense of belonging. So a number of the young people that we worked with, when you are different in some way, especially in a regional town, you're at risk of being marginalised and of not feeling that sense of belonging. And I think one of the great uh, experiences, even for me as a pro program manager with this project, was working through the project um, over those that year-long period or 18-month period where there were several opportunities for, um, you know, to come back where the arts team, Memoration Arts, came back and worked with us and developed the depth of the relationship over time. And it definitely affected the levels of trust and that connectedness within the group. I think um, universal themes really are the empowerment. I mean, capacity building projects in community are liberating for individuals. The skills that they learn, whether it's through a creative arts process or another facilitated community engagement program, stay with them and go with them into the world. And I think when we're thinking about getting organised, you know, the theme of today is getting angry and getting organised, Capacity building is uh, a great way of sowing the, the future seeds of the kind of vision for our community that we want to see. Um, a great, I must play, pay tribute to Sarah Vine Vassalo, um, something you don't know about Dennis. Dennis is actually a Churchill Fellow, I was reading on his bio. I'm very fortunate that Sarah Vine Vassalo, the artistic director from Memoration, is also a Churchill Fellow. So she had a period of her time overseas uh, on arts and disability dance, and we were so fortunate to have her skills come to our rural country town and her inclusive team come and work with us. And uh, I think probably in terms of um, skill development, uh, that's the one thing I'll say about regional towns is we can't sustain permanent infrastructure in the long term, but project work is definitely a way in. So, you know, maybe you live in a town of 500 people, you can bring a group of resources together for a temporary period of time and do a capacity building project. And then the legacy will be magnified from that event. Are we going for time, Brett? A few more minutes. Okay, very good. Um, the other thing is, the Arts Centre itself is a multi-purpose project. It came out of a decade-long volunteer project. So we are the ultimate, uh, I think, community that said to its council, we want an art centre. So a group of volunteers spent a decade renovating that art centre. It's a multi-purpose centre. It has a visual arts studio. It has a 120-seat theatre, film infrastructure, um, a sprung floor for dance. The great thing about this project is it actually activated our space in, in all those ways. We had visual arts, we had music, we had dance and theatre and movement, and we, had, and we used our exhibition space as well. So it really dovetailed nicely that it tied in with the resource we had, it brought amazing skills to town, and it activated the skills within our own young people. Um, another thing I would just say if you're working on project work, the power of legacy. Uh, the power of documenting your project really well. I mean, I honestly think a big reason I'm here today talking to you is the power of that video. I think if the, um, our community team hadn't seen that video, those young people can speak so much more eloquently about what they got out of this project, more than just me speaking at a microphone to you. Um, and the other thing I feel very passionately about is mentorship. You know, this is a new generation of young people. Um, during that project, we mentored three young people, uh, three emerging young artists. And I, I'm really proud to say uh, Mentee 1 is now employed at a regional arts centre. Mentee 2 has now um, upped his capacities involved with more community theatre work. And um, the third mentee, who was a very non-confident and didn't have a lot of belief in herself, um, is a young lady living with disability who now has open employment in a full-time job in our community. So I think those um, outcomes are a great legacy to sort of take out of this project. I think we must be getting close. Yeah. So um, 
thank you for listening and I'm, I take inspiration and I'm looking forward to some questions because I think relationships is, is a really powerful tool and I think if we want to build the communities of the future, I think authentic relationships face to face is where we're going to do a lot of that great work. Thank you. How good's Elise? Right. I'm going to keep using that material. That is quality A-list stuff. Now, we move on. Anita McCurdy, who will be presenting right here, is a man manages the program called Education First Youth Foyer for Berry Street. I've had the pleasure of working with some of your colleagues, mainly here in Richmond in the HQ, and I've worked with, it's now 900 plus nonprofits over 20 years. And I'm not just saying this because you're on stage, but I have not met a more devoted, passionate and pragmatic group of top-level managers at any organisation. I've met some of the young, many of the young people with whom you worked in the Why Change program in particular. They are essentially seeding the next generation of leaders, not just to take a place in the economy, but to change the goddamn system. And I love your slogan, we never give up. I mean, that's pretty fundamental, isn't it? I love that. Um, Anita, on a more personal note, you have been described to me as a powerhouse social worker. You know that old joke about social workers? I, I'm not, you know, how, how many does it take to change a light bulb? One, but the light bulb's going to want to change. Well, with Anita, the light bulb changes whether it wants to bloody well or not. And that, that assessment of your skills has been confirmed just this week. I know you, this will make you a bit uncomfortable, but the um, College of um, Social Work has declared Anita Australia's number one ranked social worker for 2019. Round of applause, please, folks. All right. Not really. Do you actually think they're ranking social workers? No. <laughs> Don't be so manipulable. That's not even a word. But you know, it's not a bad idea. I've got to talk to this new government about that. Ladies and gentlemen, to talk about this idea that puts roofs over young people's heads and stability underneath them, please make Anita very welcome. Number one. Number one. Well, I was sort of half excited that you get recognised for something like that, as we all know. Um, I've been around for um, over 20 years in the youth sector in Shepparton. So um, all those that work with uh, the adolescents and the naughty teenagers and the um, ones that aren't going to get anywhere, um, hi to you all. And it's very difficult work at times. Um, so I would like to start with just... We've, I've got a slideshow, but I'm not going to bore you with it. I'll hopefully just be able to use this because social workers are pretty technical um, savvy, aren't we? So um, we have got a partnership um, in Shepparton. We're actually the third um, Education First Youth Foyer that was funded in Victoria. Um, we started in 2016 and I was um, pretty much hired before the building was ready. So <laughs> it was a very um, interesting time and recruited the team before the building was ready. Uh, but what the building entails is um, 40 bedrooms for young people who are homeless or risk of homelessness. So that's where our partnership comes in. Berry Street's the support part. Um, beyond housing is the tenancy and maintenance of the building, thank goodness, because as you could imagine, 40 units after two years and how much maintenance happens <laughs> um, along the way. So I don't have to worry about that, but I do have to worry about um, the education first part, which is that the young people are attending school and that's our number one part. So yes, it's a absolute an amazing job. Um, it's a dream job after 20 years of uh, working in the out of home sector out of home care sector, sorry, and um, in refuge, where all we focused on was problems. It was problem this, problem that, they've come from this, they've come from that, and it was very um, taxing, I suppose, on teams, and it's very taxing on us um, working for not much money either. I just thought I'd pop that in. But um, so we uh, had the building there, um, it's actually in the CBD. Um, the Brotherhood of St Lawrence had opened the other two with launch housing um, in the city and we were the first regional um, ones to come aboard, which was um, pretty amazing, great timing because uh, Shepparton was already grassroots happening with lots of initiatives in the, the youth sector but also in the business sector. So we have the Committee for Greater Shepparton um, had formed uh, probably a few years before us 
So youth was on their agenda and it was about redefining what they could do for young people as well as um, this, our sector was pretty much fragmented and it still is. Shepparton has lots of initiatives because we are pretty high up there with our stats of unemployment, uh, youth unemployment, low education rates and um, teenage pregnancies and you name it, we were up there. We're with Broadmeadows along the way. So um, basically I'll, what's happened with this um, program is that we've been able to do a certificate of developing independence. So when the young people come in, they have a self-contained um, room. So there's 40 of them. Yes, there's 40 in the CBD. And Touchwood, um, we've made it a way um, about focusing on what their talents are, their aspirations, um, and pretty much the language that we use is not around their deficits and problems. Yes, we have barriers and we have some issues that we may attend to if it rises, but it's about actually looking at them and valuing, looking at them, working with them, listening to them, and valuing them um, as they are in a bedroom that looks like a motel room, basically. <laughs> um, and place is a very important part of our model as well, because if you are in a place that looks great and you feel valued, then you will look, um, you'll look after that place. And I've worked in refuge, and anyone that's worked in refuge will know um, that it's very difficult uh, to, to, you know, respect a place that doesn't get much funding to look up, um, to get better with it. So uh, basically, this has been awesome. So in the Developing Independence Certificate, we have six areas that have been researched to show that if we work with young people on this, they will, this will help build their aspirations, but also, more importantly, if they succeed and link to community and build social capital, that they will um, succeed in their transition to adulthood, which I often refer to as adulting. So, um, the first ones, um, so there's some pictures here in the slides, but we've had um, probably over 80 young people um, that have come through. We've actually had 120 come through the program after over the two and a half, nearly three years, and we've had 80 that have um, graduated from the, their um, Certificate of Developing Independence, which is our link to go TAFE. Um, it's really important with the Education First model that you are near a TAFE. They don't have to actually have their, their main full-time study or part-time study there. There's, they're linked into everywhere else as well, but the one of the mandatories is they do this certificate. And during this certificate, they're very connected to the community and that's probably what we're talking about today, the innovation of getting community on board. And um, this has been a vehicle to help us do that because we don't have many tools in the youth sector to try to connect that. You know, you can talk and talk and talk, but to have something that's um, actually tangible and in front of us all the time is an awesome way of doing it. So there's some graduations there. We're also on Instagram and Facebook, so I'll shamelessly ask you to follow us, um, which would be great. Uh, so Education First um, obviously is the number one part of um, the, the program. The other one is employment, which we have got um, people coming in as indust for industry nights and because we're a bit of a hub, people actually come in and have their a AGMs there. The young people will cook for, the, for whatever's happening, cater, so we're always, they've always got opportunities to link. Um, the industry nights are great because then it has led to mentoring as well with young people as, and, um, yeah, gone through it, getting them involved as well. So. Um, the health and wellbeing is another area that's um, really important um, and we've got a basketball team, we actually have a netball team at the moment as well. And these are young people that otherwise wouldn't be linked into any of this stuff, so the Developing Independence Certificate's really helped that. Um, civic participation is a huge one and part of community as well and has really... Um, this, this area is probably really important for Shepparton because we do have lots of opportunities as well to help um, link the young people into those things that are, as young people who are basically couldn't find anywhere to live, you know, a month before or then out um, volunteering to do different things has been amazing and it's great to watch how much they enjoy that type of stuff as well. And... Um, social connections is um, a really important one with family and we're building some more resources around social connections to support whether or not they return to family or they're actually just linking with family. Um, but the community helps with that, with our mentoring program as well. 
um, to try and help connect so when they transition out, they actually have got a fairly big social capital as well. Um, housing living is an obvious one, but um, yeah, we've had lots of young people. There's a young person up there that's cooked her first cake, and I know that sounds really minimal, but to young people, um, that's huge. And it was a very exciting day for her um, when she actually cooked something and it worked. Um, so the basic little things are really important as well for us to celebrate. Um, even though it seems minimal to others, it's really important for them. And, yeah, so we've just got some extra things in there. But it's basically mentoring is our focus now to get the businesses. We, we already have bits and pieces happening, but hopefully to work. And we, I know this morning they were talking about to focus on those positives and to actually build on things that you're doing well with. So that's what our, our thing will be this year is to get businesses and mentoring a bit more um, um, tangible, I suppose, and having those connections so then we can um, keep them if any of us leave because, of course, teams change all the time and we don't want to lose that, um, lose that momentum that we have going as well. So um, I think that might be it. And we're in the newspaper all the time. We're averaging once every two weeks for a little while and I think we're nearly back up there. <laughs> so I think that's it. But, yeah, just follow us if you want to on Insta or Facebook. Thanks, everyone. How good's Anita? Right, OK. <laughs> Madeline, prepare to take the lectern. I notice a lot, and there's something to be investigated here, that a small, excited, and suitably skilled bunch of volunteers working for nothing can often outperform paid professionals charged with the same task. In fact, I see that again and again and again. Um, Madeline Price is the founder and national director of the One Woman Project, which is 99% volunteer driven. It has a rather large mission, it promotes gender equality. Are you there yet, Madeline? Not quite? Any moment now. <laughs> and they work across the country and indeed somewhat internationally too. And they do uh, a, range, a range of things. School-based workshops tackling the issue of gender equality. Uh, they run awareness campaigns. And they run the Brisbane Feminist Festival. Are the Queenslanders here in the room? Make yourself known. By the way, look, um, based on Saturday's election result, inspired by Bob Hawke's response to Tiananmen Square, I am willing to offer you asylum here in Victoria. OK? <laughs> Seems the least I can do. But the Brisbane Feminist Festival, another way to spruik the message, although this year there's an exciting development. Uh, they're moving to Townsville thanks to a corporate sponsorship with Adani. And it's going to be the Adani <laughs> New Feminists Open Bracket for Coal Festival. <laughs> Keynote speakers Matthew Canavan and George Christensen. Very exciting stuff. <laughs> We've got to be pragmatic people and Madeline is nothing if not. Ladies and gentlemen, please make Madeline very welcome. <laughs> When you said short I was, or small team, I was like, are you referencing the five-foot stature that I have right here? Can everyone see me? <laughs> She's there, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> I could be hologram as well, who knows? Um, so before I begin, I would also like to start by acknowledging that we meet on stolen land where sovereignty was never ceded, and I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, some of whom might be in the room amongst us. Now, because my passion is gender equality and I work in that field, I'd also like to pay specific attention and respect to the unique challenges faced by First Nations women, trans and non-binary individuals within contemporary Australian society. Now, I'm going to start today with a little bit of a story, and I would like to preface it, similar to Tracy Spicer, by saying that I'm going to be talking about family, domestic and sexual violence. And if at any time you do need to leave, you're more than welcome to, and if you need further resources after this point, feel free to get in touch with me or with the relevant parties in your state. Now, at the end of last year, I got to attend one of our rural road trips. So each year, we visit thousands upon thousands of students and talk about issues of global gender inequality. And a significant portion of this is through rural road trips. I grew up in a rural Queensland community. Does anyone know where Imbal is? Yes? Oh, good. Has anyone heard of Gympie? Yes, there we go. Gympie's quite well known. About half an hour outside of Gympie is Imbal. And I grew up in this rural uh, Queensland community on a beef cattle farm. And so I'm very passionate about engaging with rural young people. And so over the past few years, we've engaged with about 7,500 young people through our Rural Road Trips initiative. So at the end of last year, I was at a school 
a couple of hours west of Toowoomba, for anyone who knows Queensland, and I just finished a workshop talking about gender roles and stereotypes and consent and healthy relationships and leadership and all of the things you can fit into a couple of hours with a group of students. And at the end of this workshop, this young girl came up to me. She had tears in her eyes. Before I could comfort her, she wrapped me with her tiny arms, oh, I'm gonna move this, with her tiny arms in a massive hug and said, thank you. Thank you for talking to me about issues of gender inequality. Thank you for talking to my peers about issues of gender inequality. And then she told me her story. So she'd experienced sexual violence in her own community. And she'd done the really incredibly brave thing of taking it to the local authorities and seeing it through the court system. Now, through this years-long process, no one until now had ever spoken to her about the concept of re-traumatisation, of how a sight or a smell or a sound could bring back the memories of the violence that she had endured. No one had ever spoken to her about re-victimisation, about the fact that the chance of her experiencing this type of violence was heightened in the future. No one had ever spoken to her about managing strategies for when, at the local store, she saw her perpetrator or her per perpetrator's family, or what to do and how to speak to her friends and her family about those triggers, those sights and smells and sounds that could make her relive the experience. And no one, until that moment, had ever spoken to her or her peers about consent or healthy relationships or the entrenched gender roles and stereotypes that underpin absolutely everything we see within this space. She was 13 and she'd been through the court system, she'd experienced sexual violence, but she still didn't really understand what it all meant and how it impacted her. Now, I grew up in a rural community, as I mentioned, and I've seen firsthand the entrenched gender roles and stereotypes that we have in rural, regional, rural, regional and remote Australia, and of course in our metropolitan counterparts. I've seen the increased statistics and the heightened possibilities of violence for women, trans and non-binary individuals within our rural, regional and remote communities compared to their metropolitan counterparts. And I've also seen the distinct divide in the education and extracurricular opportunities available for our rural communities as opposed to our metropolitan communities, particularly around issues of social justice, gender-based violence, gender justice, climate change, anything under the spectrum. Now, for me, what wasn't surprising was her story. We've been to a ton of rural communities, but we had the exact same stories come from young people within them. What was a little bit surprising was that afterwards she came up to me and said, it was easier to talk to you because you're young. Now granted, I turned 26 this year, so I was a good decade and a bit older than her at this point, at the end of last year. But that simple statement, it was easier to talk to you because you were young, was one that really stuck with me. It's one that I've heard before, but usually not from students. Usually I hear it from teachers who say that the sole reason they contacted us to talk about issues of gender roles and stereotypes or leadership or violence or whatever it happens to be was because they wanted their young people to hear it from fellow young people or from principals who've got us in to talk at their school leadership conferences and demonstrate the power and passion and skills and experience of young leaders. And on occasion, I do hear it from students who say that the sole reason they bothered to listen that day was because someone who looked like them was facilitating the discussion. Now, in light of that, out of all of you who work in the room, I want you to raise your hand if you work with young people, either as beneficiaries, supporters, um, they're part of your organisations, if you do anything with young people in your community organisations. Awesome, fair few of us in the room, fantastic. Now, I want you to raise your hand if your organisation works with young people and you yourself or anyone on your senior leadership team is under the age of 30. Yeah, a couple of people? Anyone under the age of 20? Okay, I promise this will be over soon. Now, <laughs> I want you to raise your hand if you work with young people as beneficiaries, supporters, as part of your organisation 
and you actively recruit through using up resources, time, energy, money, people power. You actively recruit paid staff and volunteers under the age of 20. Couple of people? Good, awesome, that is fantastic. Everyone else who works with young people, oh, we're gonna have a chat. So, I work in an organization that is, fun fact, 100% volunteer led and 100% youth led. So we have 40 young people who run absolutely everything that we do. From our rural road trips, to our other educational programs in schools, to the Brisbane Feminist Festival, to our other events, our campaigns, our corporate engagement, everything that we do is run by young people. Because we believe in young people leading people. If we're going to have a program that's designed to educate young people about global gender inequality, they shouldn't just have a seat at the decision making table. They should be building up the skills and experience and knowledge to be leading their fellow peers. So a really good example is our current National Director of People and Culture, so head of HR, is this fantastic young woman called Lyndon. She started with the organisation a few years ago as a high school intern, moved into managing our high school intern program, and at the ripe old age of 22, took over as head of HR for the entire organisation. She manages the recruitment and the professional development and the welfare of our 40 plus team members across our national and international locations. In the organisation, our youngest volunteer is part of our high school ambassador program and clocks in at the ripe old age of 12 because no other organisation would give her an opportunity to volunteer. Our oldest volunteer is going to hit 31 this year, so ageing out of the organisation very quickly. But the purpose behind this is that we want young people leading other young people. What was really interesting was I get to talk about young people a lot, and I get to read a lot of research about engaging young people in organisations or in communities or in groups or just engaging young people in society. And I came across a really interesting study from the Australian Research Alliance for Children and Youth. So in 2015, they released this report that basically said, young people are volunteering in these spaces and we've got half a million young people in Australia between 15 and 24 who are currently engaged in their local communities and 55.6 of young people aged 12 to 24 volunteer in an informal or formal capacity each week. Hidden amongst that though, was this tiny nugget of wisdom about why people, young people, don't volunteer. Now, young people don't volunteer with organisations that are boring or poorly organised. Boring and poorly organised. Now, look around the room. Do we look boring and poorly organised? I hope not. I hope we don't look boring and poorly organised. But it really got me thinking. For young people, what does boring and poorly organised actually look like? Did some digging, had some conversations, because We've never had problems recruiting young people to participate in a youth-led movement. They keep flying to us and we just keep finding little places to put them and building them with skills. But the perception of the wider community, for-purpose, non-for-profit, social enterprise sector is that we're boring and poorly organised. For young people, boring and poorly organised are roles without set responsibilities or a predetermined position description. Boring and poorly organised are roles requiring years upon years of experience in a skill set that could be trained or expanded or learnt or taught. Boring and poorly organised are roles that have no social impact, that they can't see the tangible impact of what they do. Boring and poorly organised are roles that are in organisations that don't provide training or upskilling opportunities or peer-to-peer -peer mentoring for their young people or at a base level, reward and recognition for everyone involved in the journey. They're roles with little to no flexibility in organisations striving to promote diversity, but stuck in our old ways. So at the One Woman Project, for instance, we pride ourselves on the fact that 80% of our roles can be done remotely, and they are done remotely. So not only does this allow us to reach a broader geographic location of diverse young people, it also gives opportunities to those who might have chronic illness or disability or mental health concerns, or who might be from a low socioeconomic background and can't afford the travel costs to participate in in-person meetings in their local capital city. Or it might be culturally and linguistically diverse young people who are more subject to community and family responsibilities preventing them 
from engaging in after hours meetings, for instance. That flexibility has literally changed the, the group of young people and the access we can have to young people. Now, when you first heard the words boring and poorly organised, did a couple of organisational names spring to mind? Did you have a bit of a think and you're like, oh yeah, I know those organisations. I know, I know exactly which organisations those young people are thinking about. But have you ever thought that they might be thinking about your organisation? That the roles or responsibilities that you're portraying on the website is what is preventing young people from participating? Or the lack of flexibility is preventing a diverse young person who's really passionate but can't make it to that particular location at that exact time but could participate in an equally valuable way. If you are one of those organisations that immediately thought, I know which organisations are boring and poorly organised, but it's not me, and are now suddenly reflecting and thinking, oh, it might be, oops, I set you this challenge. It's particularly if you're an organisation that engages with young people as supporters and beneficiaries and as community members. Take one single step when you go home, back to the workplace on Wednesday, to make yourselves not boring and poorly organised. And watch as the flood of young people come in. I'm passionate about young people because our future is our young people. And I can't wait to see what they create. Thanks. Folks, please join me in thanking our panellists, Madeline, Elise, Dennis, and Anita. Now, folks, as a token of our appreciation, we want to give our panellists something that um, really means something. And so we have gone out and sourced uh, four little items that um, really show how special you are to us. It is the most important substance known to man, and I thought with the new Morrisonian era in which we've entered, it was important to show this to everybody. Folks, it is a lump of coal. You get a lump of coal. You get a lump of coal. Take that to Yak and Dandra and see what they do with it. Madeline else everybody gets a lump of coal to take home and power and as a feminist organization you will know from our leaders that coal has powered many um, stove tops that women have used to put food on the table for their husbands so there you go Madeline something special